It's great to be joined today by Jeremy Baumberg, who's a professor of nanoscience at the University of Cambridge, also author of the new book, The Secret Life of Science. Uh, Jeremy, it's so great to talk to you. One place I want to start is one that we've been discussing for a long time, and it relates to a talking point that you sometimes hear thrown about in popular culture, that for some people, uh, science is equivalent to a religion, that it works like a religion. And one of the most interesting things about science to me that really differentiates it from religion, aside from all of the other obvious ways, is that rather than sort of creating an echo chamber, it actually encourages the disproof of what are often considered the uh, sort of common sense or accepted explanations for phenomena. In fact, there's sort of like great rewards for doing so. And you address that in the book, but you also point out that that sort of free market Wild West element of science can really narrow the focus of many scientists. So let's start maybe there. Talk a little bit about how you believe the science world is functioning uh, in general at this time. Okay, it's a really interesting question because it combines, I guess, two aspects that scientists like. One of them is this sense of a mainstream, something that everybody agrees on that uh, is very robust, I think. That's what's one of the amazing things about science that really doesn't make it a religion that is um, generally, even though people might have sometimes maverick results that might even get published, actually what happens is this, this huge amount of science which is is building in different directions. It's like it's like a sort of um, I imagine like a big web of a sort of forest of tree trunks, enormous things. And if you add something that doesn't fit, it just gets papered over and lost. And and really the thing is incredibly robust. Otherwise everything would come crashing down. Um, at the same time, as you say, in this sort of competitive system that we have, there are huge rewards for showing that something is completely different. So trying to build a new branch in a completely different direction in sort of an empty void that was never there before. And the, the interesting thing is how difficult it is to do that. Um, you have to convince everybody because you start growing a little sapling in some particular area and if it really isn't robust, it just falls off, it withers away. But that's how science sort of works, is that some of these ideas actually are correct and then we build on them and the whole enterprise incorporates that into the fabric. So I, I think that the strong thing about it is it, it evolves. It's not completely static. Uh, it, it does evolve and for that, you know, this, this sort of web of really strong results is one of the strong things about science, which is what's in good shape. And it, yet at the same time, the competition encourages people to find something different, something new that will gain them huge notoriety and, and, and therefore success. Um, but they have to convince everybody else that that's correct. So um, that the tension between those sides is, is partly good. What we might ask is, um, of the money of the huge amount of resources we put into science, are we using it most efficiently to find those new places? Yeah, that always seems to be, I mean, here in the United States, as, as I'm sure you're aware, there is a political movement which uh, likes to focus on such uh, financial subjects as waste and debt and government spending. And it's become very, very popular to find very uh, particular scientific projects that look at, you know, the mating rituals of the manatee uh, only during April of odd numbered years, right? I mean, of course, that's not a real my, one, my but favorite thing it's, is always, actually, uh, it's always caricatured, yeah, right? My, my favorite example is actually showing, does moonlight make plants grow? <laughs> exactly. And, you know, and, and, and very, is, very often, a very, very small amount. These are presented as sort of examples of where science is doing something that's of no purpose or, or use or significance whatsoever. And I'm curious what your sense is of when, when that is brought up, does it make sense to argue the merits of the particular scientific endeavor? Or is there some broader meta argument that is more logical in those conversations? I think the first thing that's very important is that uh, there is lots of um, uh, investment in science, research in science that just wouldn't happen without our governments funding it. Uh, and it ha it's more and more the case. It used to be that we had big corporate labs, uh, high tech had enough funding to actually go off and, and research things in new directions. And, and because finance is trying to be so efficient, all of this is gone. So companies have almost zero to really invest in, in research. A few big giants 
are able to go in certain areas and they make big noise about it. I used to work for Hitachi and that was the same thing. They had a large amount of uh, you know, money and a small amount was invested in really long range um, science projects, which were impressive. But by and large, it's only really government funding that produces ideas that then can be taken forward. That for me is the thing to really concentrate on. Now, the difficulty is if we knew how to choose which projects we would, you know, were the good, the good ones, then there would be no problem. Then industry could just choose it. The difficulty is when we do science, we really don't know how it's going to pan out. There's a large amount of risk involved. So we have to fund in different directions. And the question is, how do we create a system which is most likely to choose directions that will show these new directions, you know, and unusual ones, as well as take the things that we want to improve forward um, with the li highest likelihood? And because of the risky nature of science, that's a really difficult thing. Many scientists, you know, many people will say, oh, we can pick the winners. But generally, people can't pick winners. There's a large amount of randomness involved. So, you know, scientists often complain that their grant was not funded. Um, but it's actually even more difficult to try and decide from a huge array of grants, which you can fund maybe a few percent of them, which ones are the best investment for our society. Um, and generally, scientists do approach that in a, in, a, in a very impressive way, but actually, you know, in the end, it's very difficult to do it. And that's why some of these other examples come around where it doesn't sound like, why did somebody choose this sort of project? Do you think that yeah. in some sense, science is expanding in a way that is not the optimal way? So one of the things that uh, surprised me in, in this book, I actually started this book with no preconceptions at all. I just started to try and track down some answers to questions that I was experiencing or people around me would complain about this or that. And I was figured, that, well, it's your system. You know, why don't you change it? It's, it's nobody's making us do it this way. And as I started to try and understand it, I came across some things which were I didn't expect to find them. And I, it, it turns out that most people don't know about them. So one of the things that I think is, is quite important to realize is how the number of scientists is increasing. So if I ask people, you know, is the number of physicists in the world going up or the number of chemists? I mean, most, most scientists don't know. Certainly the general public doesn't know. Um, but actually it's increasing at, a, at about 4% a year. It's about four times the world's population increase. So the world population is, is increasing by less than a percent now and dropping quite fast. Uh, but the number of scientists has been carrying on at this growth rate for over 50 years and shows no signs of stopping at all. And then there's an interesting question. Well, what happens as you put more people into science? It doesn't it sounds like a good idea. More more scientists should give you more science, more breakthroughs and more development. It's not clear it works like that. Um, generally, when you put more scientists into science, they don't do all radically different things. They tend to clump around particular areas that are sort of hot, what we call bandwagon areas. So they end up sort of often replicating each other's work or competing very intensely, but to try and do the same things. And that's part of this ecosystem, this competition that, that is huge and, and ferocious within the science community. So um, the, the difficult thing, I think, is um, at some point, clearly, there are going to be too many scientists. Uh, you know, there probably were too few scientists in the past. But the question is, how do we decide what's the right number of scientists? We might say, well, the free market will just decide, you know, at a certain point, our societies will decide, well, that's the number of scientists that we can fund. We don't just fund them in, in you know, academia and universities. Also, industry funds a huge number of scientists, about half the number in the world or, or a little bit more are actually within industry. And so we're paying through them for them through the products that we buy. And that might be, you know, medical advances in, in a very large way. These these uh, these investment is coming from a whole range of different directions, but still at the same time we're paying for them. So at some point we might say, well, you know, it'll just we'll just stop doing that. Interestingly, it seems for most societies, when the number of scientists is a, a few percent, it rises to a certain amount of the GDP and it stops. And I always sort of joke that the reason it stops is because if you if you write a single page of what a country spends its money on, uh, science funding stops when it actually appears on that page because it's got large enough. It's something like, you know, a fraction of the medical budget, a tenth or something like that. Uh, and it's because then people say, well, what are we getting for our money? And it's very hard to decide because it's a very long term investment. It's well, the, along it's those the best lines, investment. Jeremy, what I mean, two things I'm thinking of, if I hear you saying this are. So you've got the increase in, in the number of scientists of 4%, which you cited. Uh, would your view of that be different if, number one, 
funding for science increased in parallel with the increase in the number of scientists? Because it seems if you increase the number of scientists and not the funding, you're just taking the same amount of funding and splitting it into smaller and smaller pieces. But also if there was some mechanism to make sure that the areas of focus are diversified rather than the sort of clustering around the same, the same areas. So both of these, I think, are very important. So scientists themselves will tell you that it's harder and harder to get funding. Mm. Um, and there, there's some truth in it, but of course the budgets for science have always been going up. As far as I can see, they've never gone down. Um, they, they, they are not, I mean, they're, they're generally keeping pace also with the number of scientists, but they're very unequally spread. What's happened is also the aspiration of scientists to do more and more work has increased faster than the rate of funding. So, uh, and that's partly because of uh, globalization, actually. So scientists used to work in a smaller community, maybe their national community, maybe even their smaller field. And now they see they're exposed to science from all around the world. And, and actually in the media, we want to see more and more science as well. We're more and more interested in it. So uh, scientists' aspirations for what makes great impact for breakthroughs has gone up enormously. So they want more resources to do that. So partly it might be resetting some of that or deciding how we're going to, to do that. Um, the other side of it, as you say, is how do we increase the diversity? So uh, one of the things I think is really you know, a, a good way to look at science is like an ecosystem, like a natural ecosystem. One of the things we learn from natural ecosystems is that um, if you, everything is done the same way, if, if there is a dominance of a particular species or a particular uh, 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 food chain in that system, it loses resilience and, and its diversity is contracted and it's a big problem for that system in the long term. I, one of the things I, I, I now feel about um, the science ecosystem is the globalization is not wholly good because what happens is people use more and more best practice. So the way of funding science in the US is becoming more and more like the way we fund science in the UK or the EU or in China, because people copy the same models. Hmm. And so the same things get funded everywhere to the same extent. And um, the problem is then a lack of diversity. So some way to reset that would be good. So actually, I, I joke that also then the university, I'm in charge of creating anarchy. So I think anarchy is extremely important, or you, you might call it diversity. So different ways of actually funding science. Um, so we just need more and more examples of this and thinking of ways to, to enhance this change within the system. The book is fascinating. It's called The Secret Life of Science. We've been speaking with the book's author, Jeremy Baumberg, who's professor of nanoscience at the University of Cambridge. Uh, not Cambridge, Massachusetts, three miles from our studio, but uh, Cambridge, England, of course. Jeremy, thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you very much. Very nice to be on.